What's going on, everybody? It's the Fonson Way here for Unscripted episode number 119 for your f Sunday, May the 16th, 2020. And we have some breaking news starting off this episode. Just like I believe we did last week with the Uso, one of the Usos being out injured. This one has to do with a current, a former WWE star who just wrestled in their last match on Friday. Now, if you've been watching over the last four, three months, four months, Daniel Bryan and Drew Gulak have been in a some kind of like partnership. Drew is his coach, Daniel Bryan, who had a match with Gulak at the pay per view, the Elimination Chamber. They had a hell of a match, and Daniel Bryan went up to Drew Gulak and was like, "Listen." You, you pushed me further than I thought you were going to be able to, so I want you to be my coach. And they became coach and, and like student and teacher type thing. Well, of course, just like same like you'd have Sami Zayn and other heels make fun of Drew Gulak because who is Drew Gulak? What has Drew Gulak done since he lost the Cruiserweight Championship at the end of la towards the end of last year to Leo Rush? He came up. He was. Went from being this sub submission badass to a PowerPoint presentation, and then he disappeared after Ron Strowman killed him twice. Drew Gulak no longer is on WWE's roster. According to PW Insider reports that Gulak was not released, but his contract expired after SmackDown. WWE and Gulak were trying to come to terms on a new deal since his contract expired. Gulak doesn't have a 90 day no compete clause. So he can wrestle anywhere, anytime he wants. So if AEW comes to Colin, he can show up there. If this lockdown stuff ends and we can have independent shows or Impact can have shows or he can go to Impact Wrestling, he can show up there. NWA comes back in, he can show up there. He can go anywhere, anytime, anyplace. Gorak's last match, of course, was on Friday with that beautiful match against Daniel Bryan. With That's the way he goes out. Hell of a way to go out on, 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 on for WWE, having a hell of a match in the in the first round of the title tournament. He debuted with WWE in 2016 during the Cruiserweight Classic. Hell of a loss by WWE. They have a lot of great talents. They have released talent, a lot of great talent. Gulak is another one of those casualties to everything. Honestly, in my opinion, Drew Gulak was probably. When he lost that Cruiserweight Championship to Leo Rush, and he was being brought to SmackDown, I would not be surprised if this guy knew from the day he was brought back to SmackDown that he's not going anywhere. He's not, he has hit his ceiling. WWE is not going to use him to his full potential, and it's better off he not say a thing. And honestly, this one comes out of nowhere because, like, Dean Ambrose last year, Everyone wondered, is Danny Ambrose going to sign? No, he's not going to sign. What is WWE going to do with him? They treated him so well, thinking maybe he's going to go away for a while because everyone gets burned out after a while, especially in the WWE schedule. He'll go away and he'll be back by the Royal Rumble 2020. Of course, that didn't happen. He immediately signed with AEW. Probably as soon as midnight hit on his contract, he was in negotiations with AEW to sign there. Gulak... Like, usually when somebody's contract's coming out, we hear it in the rumor mill. There was none of this for Drew Gulak. So, this just shows that he probably kept himself. He had it marked on the day. May, May 15th, 2020 is my last day. Oh, I'm sorry, not May 15th, but May, yeah, May 15th, 2020. That is going to be a SmackDown edition of tapings. And this is back, back probably in January, like January of last year. This pandemic stuff was not going on, so he didn't have any idea he was going to be in an empty arena in his last match. But he goes out there, he gives you one hell of a match, and he leaves on that. Now, Drew Lock has not was not doing anything until Daniel Bryan said, Hey, Vince, I have it in my contract who I get to work with. I want to work with this guy. I want to work with Drew Lock, show you that this guy is worth his time his contract and his and your time so let me work at this guy you got drew gulak working with daniel bryan and instead of getting fired he got to run, run, run out his contract and he's gone so gulak is no longer a part of wwe now of course just like many other people from the cruiserweight division he has had ups he has had downs he 
He start, He was a hell of a guy in the Cruiserweight Classic. Then they brought him over to 205 Live. Well, 205 Live was won by Vince McMahon. He was doing the whole PowerPoint presentation bullshit, which went nowhere. Then when, when Vince McMahon, when Triple H took over, he went back to being what, he's, what he should be, the submission specialist. The rough, tough, badass who's going to go out there and just, like, make you go night-night. And then he came up, then he went back down to NXT. He went down to NXT, was Cruiserweight Champion for a bit. He was the guy who transitioned the WWE, the, Cru the NXT Cruiserweight Championship from WWE Cruiserweight to NXT Cruiserweight before losing it to Leo Rush. Then came up to SmackDown, did nothing for months. Daniel Bryan puts him under his wing and says, we're going to do things and we're going to go out there and have a hell of a fucking time. And boom, he left, his, he left just like that. So yeah, Drew Gulak gone. Let me know in the comment section what you, what your favorite match with Drew Gulak was. I would say it was either last night, like Friday's match between Daniel Bryan and him, or his match for the Cruiserweight title against Leo Rush. That was a hell of a match as well. He had some great matches in the Cruiserweight division when Triple H was running the Cruiserweights because he got to go out there and show you what he can do. Unlike Vince McMahon, who just wants him to be, he wanted him to be a goofball. It would not surprise me if next week's episode of Talk is Jericho, if it isn't already recorded, is going to be Drew Gulak's turn on the mic with, Jer with Jericho. Now, moving on here. So, WWE. I wanted to talk a little bit about Becky Lynch, and we will later. I'm also going to give you my review and my thoughts of the first episode of The Last Ride, which is going to go for five weeks. Second episode being tonight. Um, WWE, like... Since this whole empty arena era has been going on, it has, like, AEW has done something that WWE has refused vehemently to do. Outside of her episodes in Jacksonville after the first week, they have had wrestlers in the crowd as fans. Now, of course, when this entire thing started, WWE had their hard cam as they normally would, and it made the show look awful. These guys wrestle, and you see nobody behind them. No fans, no nothing. So what does AEW do? They put it in their first episode. They put it so it's facing the Titan Tron, so you hardly see the crowd. WWE decides that, well, they, they eventually learn from, the AEW, from AEW, and they take the hard cam and move it so it's facing the entranceway. Vince McMahon was, was pulled, kicking and screaming because Vince McMahon did not want to be seen as copying AEW. When Vince McMahon has been notorious for copying other companies in the 80s and the 90s. So, the one thing WWE has not done is they have not put crowd, fan, like, talent in the crowd as fans. Five on one side, five on the other, five on the hard, on the hard camp side. You can spread them out. A Florida has reopened somewhat, and they can allow twenty five percent of capacity into that into the arena. The problem with full sale with the performance center is it really. I don't know what the actual capacity for full set for the. Um, I keep saying full set. It's like five hundred for full sale. But performance center, I don't know what the capacity does that because it's not supposed to be set up as a wrestling, as a um, entertainment spot, as a. It's supposed to be a training facility, not where you go and actually have wrestling, live wrestling matches when, with a crowd. So I don't know if the capacity, which I'm wondering what, if they took a head count during that episode of NXT the week that all this happened on March 11th. Now, from the videos and stuff you see, it looks like they were there was a lot of people in standing room only on that night. So I don't have a clue exactly how many people they can add, but I'm pretty sure they can have 20 people in there. Just move them, move them out, spread them out to where it just so everyone can be happy with the social distancing, which is a bunch of bullshit. But we're not going to get into that. While WWE loves to do this every once in a while, they love to send out these top ten, these um, not these top tens, these surveys, and it they always have something on there that catches somebody's eye, catches fans' eyes, and they send them away, send them out to other local indie things. WWE recently sent surveys to fans to find out what would make Raw and SmackDown more enjoyable. Oh, I don't know. Better booking, better storylines, 
No more Baron Corbin. No more Charlotte Flair. Hmm. What could they do? Pushing talent that actually deserves it. Stop giving us the same old shit different day. Hmm. Ratings for WWE's Raw and SmackDown have been sliding from in March and April. So WWE said I tried to reach out to fans directly to see what would entice them to watch. Fans on Twitter posted pictures of some of the questions WWE asked. The most interesting question asked whether having superstars appear in the crowd would add to fans' enjoyment. AEW has been using wrestlers as fans since they moved to the empty arena shows. That dynamic has worked for AEW and helped start a feud between Chris Jericho and Pineapple Pete, a.k.a. Doug D. WWE asked and also asked if adding supernatural or fantastical elements would entertain, entertain the fans. It was from Jonas Jones 143. WWE is asking fans what you don't what what you don't like and why you're tuning out of Raw and SmackDown and Superstars fans is one way to help them ask. At, like all these they added all these um journalists. One is use of pyrotechnics. Superstars in, fan, or in the arena as fans. Another one as also had having superstars as part of match commentary. Well, we've had match commentary superstars before. Some have been good. Some have been dreadful. And some have just been middle of the road. Sami Zayn was absolutely great on commentary when he did it with Michael Cole by themselves. I think he should have been. I wish he would still come in because he was obviously awesome. But... AEW has been doing this for a month, for two months. When they taped all those shows in Georgia, that was the TNT tournament up until now, and even when we went back to Daly's Place here recently, in the Daly's Place, I don't care what anyone says, they have fans there. They might not be down at the arena side, but there are people in the fucking crowd. When they do front, like wide out shots or when John Moxley comes down, you see people in the crowd. It might be a small amount of numbers, but it's still those people there. But it just it just adds so much more, and like, like the ambiance is so much better. You can, like, when you have a good match going on in AEW, and you hear as they go to commercial break a small crowd chanting "This is awesome," and then you go over to NXT and you watch that show and you hear nothing. The crowd is dead when they go to crowd, go to break. Just night in fucking day. Night and day. As we said, as I mentioned before, the crowd helps elevate a good show to a great show. A great show to a legendary show. It's just, there needs to be more of this. But WWE, of course, of course they would have to send out a survey so if you know you get the high numbers that yeah, we have fans in the crowd, they can be like, hey, we asked the fans if they wanted it. It had nothing to do with AEW, which again, AEW and Tony Khan did not come with, up with this by himself. He watched The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon right after this entire shutdown happened. He wasn't at home yet. It wasn't the Tonight Show at home edition, I think, for the next until the week after or two. And Jimmy Fallon had his writers, his producers, and his bandmates come out there, and they were all, and they were all making noise and keeping... It sounded like there was a little bit of a crowd there where you go to other night night shows and they were all cold. Um, Tony Khan was like, you know what? We're going to do what Jimmy Fallon did. We're going to have people out there to give us a little bit of an audience, a little bit of ambiance, a little bit more for us to not sound dead. Now, if you watch AEW Dark lately, they outside of that episode, that last episode coming out of Georgia, they have had no crowd there, and it kind of does take away from AEW Dark. And of course, AEW Dark is not supposed to be taken as seriously as AEW's TNT show. But just watching Monday Night Raw, and I'm sitting there like, oh god, this show sucks. And it's like, just like Becky Lynch announcing that she's pregnant on Monday Night Raw with no crowd. Could you imagine if they were in some arena with 18, like 16,000 or 10,000 people in the crowd when she's handing off the WWE Raw Women's Championship? We don't know why officially, even though it was pre-taped. But if, even if it wasn't pre-taped and it was live, and the way she came out, she was emotional. She was crying. She like, was like, she has to go away for a while. It could have been anything. 
It could have been she has cancer. It could have been she has an injury. She has some kind of disease that she has to go take a, not the virus, but something else. But it turned out to be something positive, and it's like, could you imagine that crowd reaction and how much she would have been just serenaded with positivity with a, with a, in, a, in, front of a front, in front of an actual crowd? Or you have that triple threat ladder match at WrestleMania where you had those guys go out there and crowd or no crowd, they went out there to kill each other. All three men went out there in that ladder match and with or without a crowd, they were going to go out there and damn near maim each other. Now, that match would have been great in front of a crowd. The crowd would have went crazy. There would have been crazy. Those spots would have had the reactions that you were looking for. And it's just like, it's one of those things that's like, oh, wow, this, this match was, it was good. But imagine if it had a crowd in front of it. Otis at WrestleMania taking on Dolph Ziggler in both men's first ever singles match at WrestleMania. That match needed a crowd. The aftermath after she low blows Dolph Ziggler and she, and she celebrates with Otis. He picks her up in his arms and they have that kiss at the end. Imagine the crowd reaction when that happens. It's just, ugh. Double Nothing is coming up next week. Tomorrow, next week. This show is going to be later in the week next week. My, my, later, not later in the week, but later in the day on Sunday. Because Double or Nothing is happening next Saturday. I'm hoping, because it's going to be a Daily's Place, it's not going to be in Vegas, unfortunately. But I'm hoping that there is some semblance of an actual big, like a small crowd in Daily's Place. I mean, 25% capacity of Daily's Place. What would that be? A hundred people? I wouldn't mind it. If you spread them out far enough, it still would fucking work. You have yourself a crowd. You're gonna have that ladder match, which is gonna have nine people in a battle royal type setting, which I still don't know how you're gonna make that work and make it look good. And there's just so many things. You have a crowning of a new champion. You have the world title on the line in what should be a bloodbath. The women's championship. I don't know about the tag team. The tag team titles won't be on the line because of a stadium stampede. That's going to be interesting. But it's just WWE needs fans in the crowd. There's not going to be anything, anybody in the crowd this coming Monday or this coming Friday because, or Wednesday because those were taped this past week. If they're going to have fans in the crowd, it's going to be a week after. So... Speaking of fans in the crowd, though, Vince McMahon wants SummerSlam to have a crowd by hook or by crook. He doesn't give a shit. After having to take and lose so much money on the biggest, the biggest show of the year, he is not going to want to have to sit through another empty arena show in, 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 in the Performance Center. This, earlier this week, WWE officials are potentially reportedly actively searching for a new SummerSlam location, one that will allow them to have fans in the crowd after the mayor of Boston, Massachusetts, recently announced that events where large crowds are brought together will not be allowed through the summer. Which, by the way, any, any of you mayors or politicians out there who are in, in power right now, if this is an election year and you're trying to force people to not um, to abide by your, um, your lockdowns, good luck getting reelected. Anyway, let's see here. It was noted that the, sou the southern United States is possible for a new SummerSlam location, specifically Florida or Georgia. Regarding the Wrestle votes reports that said SummerSlam weekend might be pushed back to September, it was stated by the observer that if waiting until September is the only way to have SummerSlam in, in front of a live crowd, then the feeling is that Vince would make the move. The move has has not been decided in on, on in. Vince hasn't changed, hasn't outright committed to it as SummerSlam is still scheduled for August as a midweek. Vince is the only person who will make the call and of a new SummerSlam date, and he changes his mind constantly. Which this, this, if he's the only one to make this decision, we are in for a long summer. Because honestly, Vince McMahon could say, "Well, yeah, we're going to change it," and they'd be like, "Oh no, no, I want it to be on. I want to be on this day at this time." Oh, no, we're going to go and change it to September. Oh, no, we're not going to. It's just off and on. 
That's why. That's why so many episodes of Monday Night Raw and SmackDown last year were rewritten beforehand. Something would come out, and he loved it once minute, and the next minute he wouldn't love it. So until it is announced that SummerSlam is being moved, or SummerSlam is going to be in a new location, which put it on a beach, just put it on the Florida beach, and you can charge people to be there. You can have people, whatever. Just put it on a beach. People would fucking come, come in droves, probably. <sighs> the observer added that Vince McMahon right now sees the COVID-19 pandemic as something, something inconvenient because it's getting to, in the way of his vision of what the WWE products is supposed to be and his plans are moving forward. SummerSlam is still scheduled for August 23rd for the TD Garden in Boston. As of this writing, WWE also has August 21st SmackDown Go Home show scheduled for the TD Garden. As well as NXT TakeOver Boston, my event on August 22nd, and the post-SummerSlam Raw on August 24th. The 2020 Hall of Fame induction ceremony is rumored to be conf not, but not confirmed for the same weekend after it was nixed from the 2020 36th weekend when WWE had to change their original plans for that week that due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Which, yes, he is absolutely right. This is an inconvenience. I am so sick and tired of turning on my TV and when... You hear like State Farm or something like, this is a new normal. No, motherfuckers, this is not a new normal. This is an inconvenience. You want it to be a new normal so you can keep us in control. You can keep control of us. Just saying. We will update you and I will update you when there is more on this. Like I said, Vince McMahon changes his mind constantly. Vince McMahon had to be drugged, like I said, with the, with the changing the hard camera to the Titantron. He had to be drugged, kicking and screaming to get... WrestleMania into the Performance Center. He wanted Jackson. He wanted that Tampa Bay Arena. He wanted to be in Raymond James Stadium, one way or another. There was no like Vince McMahon had to be fought time and time again because that's what Vince McMahon does. He's stubborn. He doesn't want anyone. He wants to do things his way, even if it's going to be something that hurts his company. He wants to do it his way. Vince McMahon would have run Raymond James Stadium with an empty crowd if he was allowed to. If it was up, for Vince, up to Vince McMahon, WrestleMania weekend would have went on as planned. But it wasn't up to Vince McMahon in the end. Speaking of stubbornness by Vince McMahon, this one, this one I don't see lasting at all, but The Undertaker, as we know last year, in August 2019, the Taker, uh, Undertaker was essentially a WWE lifer due to the big money deal he signed with WWE in the early parts of last year. The Wrestling Observer Newsletter now reports that Chairman Vince McMahon signed the Deadman to a, get this, 15-year deal. After angrily reacting to a non-WWE dates, he was booking. It was reported back in August that Undertaker put, put ink in the new contract that Vince made him an offer he couldn't refuse financially. There weren't many details on the contract, but it was revealed that the deal included an agreement that says Taker could no longer work the non-WWE signing dates that he had started the book. This is what led to Taker being pulled from the Starcast 3, or to Starcast 2 convention, which ran in conjunction with AEW's Double Nothing in May 2019 after he had already been announced. I don't think it has to be the fact that he went out and did outside bookings. It's the fact that he went and got booked for StarCast. If he went over and did that booking over like with Kenny McIntosh and outside the, uh, inside the ropes in the UK, and that was all he did, it was just that. I don't think Vince McMahon went on like, oh, it's nothing. It's just a little interview, whatever. But the minute he signed on for StarCast, which is in conjunction with AEW, even though they swear up and down, they are not working together. Yeah, right. Keep trying to tell yourself that. That's when he lost it because there was no talk and nothing about him signing Undertaker to a long-term deal during when he made that booking for Inside the Ropes. But as soon as it was StarCast and as soon as there was that conjunction of maybe, just maybe, Mark Calloway would show up on Double, show up at, um, double or Nothing. Oh, not Double or Nothing. Yeah, it was Double or Nothing. No, no. I'm sorry. All out. Wait, was it Double or Nothing? Was it Double or Nothing? Yeah, Double or Nothing, yeah. When it was Double or Nothing, Vince McMahon lost his cool. He lost his shit. So, Vince McMahon said, No, this is not going to happen. How could The Undertaker do this to me? I gave this guy almost 30 years 
of my of his life the best time ever and he's gonna go do that to me i don't think so and he signed him to 15 years undertaker is in his 50s he's like what 55 now undertaker is not here's the thing there was another talent in the in the 90s who signed a 20-year contract and Within the first two years of that contract, Vince McMahon could not honor that contract anymore. So Vince McMahon went out of his way to get this, co this talent to sign with the competition. And that talent, of course, was Brett the Hitman Hart. And then we got the Montreal Screwjob. Did we see anything happen like that with The Undertaker? No. But do you really think that Vince McMahon in 15 years is going to be able, like in a 15-year span, is going to be able to... Give Undertaker that entire 15 year contract, especially with the way things are going right now. My question is how many talent would Vince McMahon release to keep the Undertaker's 15 year contract valid? When Undertaker's contract expired last year, he agreed to do a few appearances and broke character to get on social media as Mark Calloway. Vince, after letting Taker go, reportedly got so mad that Taker would actually do some non WWE bookings that he offered the 15 year deal with big money. While not billed as a lifetime contract, the 15 year deal essentially a lifetime deal is taken will be almost 70 when it is expired. Vince was said to be really upset when Taker's star cast appearance was announced last year, but the lucrative contract that was offered once things calmed down between the two. The 15 year, old, the 15 year deal would be the biggest in WWE history, if not the biggest. It was reported that early 2018 that Taker was charging $25,000 per hour for a non WWE signing appearance. And that he would have no trouble getting booked at that price. And of course, the Undertaker hasn't wrestled since WrestleMania 36 going on match against AJ Styles. Do we expect him to see him? Do you expect Undertaker to be wrestling for the next 15 years? No. He was signed to 15 years. I wish WWE would put invest in young talent who are going to carry this company into the next millennium. But no, let's give Mark Calloway 15 fucking years because. You feel so butthurt because yes, you gave you built that character. It's probably the best character Vince McMahon has ever created and will ever create. And just because he went on to sign and do a couple of appearances here and there, just because and Undertaker is so loyal to WWE. Yes, it was a shock that he would go and even get announced for Starcast. It was a shock. But do you really think that that Mark Calloway was gonna go well? I'm here and I'm here for Double or Nothing or whatever. I think it was Double or Nothing. But I'm here for this um, Starcast. I'll, I'll go check out AEW's pay per view and I'll go over there. No. More than likely than not, um, Taker would have been there for the show, got on his plane, went back home that night, and been done with it. But, w, but Vince McMahon doesn't see that. Vince McMahon had the reaction that, Vince, that he had when Bret Hart was leaving to go to WCW. He didn't trust, he, it's not that he didn't trust Taker, it's that he doesn't trust those around him. Just like Vince McMahon, doesn't, it's not that Vince McMahon didn't trust Bret the Hitman Hart, who wanted to get, like, win that match at Survivor Series, come out the next night, and just say, you know what, I'm done, here's your title, I'm out of here. He didn't, it's not that he didn't trust Bret, he just didn't trust Eric Bischoff. So... It's not the fact that he's, he's upset the fact that The Undertaker would take it. I could, be, I could see that for sure because, yes, best gimmick that, Under, that Vince McMahon has ever made. It has the most longevity. It's going to have the most longevity. No, one else, no other gimmick really has lasted 30 years constantly. 30 years. Outside of a couple injuries, where a couple years where he's missed the, like, the big events, which would be WrestleMania 10, I believe, WrestleMania 2000, and then WrestleMania last year. Undertaker has not missed, like, Undertaker has missed three WrestleManias in 30 years. That's not, that, that's huge. Nobody else is ever going to be able to say that. Not a Roman Reigns, not a Shawn Michaels, not even Triple H are going to be able to say that they have met, they have been at 20, or almost 30 WrestleManias. But it is what it is. Undertaker's there for 15 years. I don't think that's going to last, but Vince McMahon does have a lot of guys under lifetime contracts. Kevin Dunn, lifetime contract. Um, I believe Pat Patterson's under lifetime contract now. Like, Howard Finkel, until he passed away, was a lifetime contract. I believe um, me and Gino Klum was under a lifetime contract. I could be wrong, but there are some in the NWWE who have lifetime contracts. 
Are they as big as this one for The Undertaker? Most likely not. But it is WWE and Vince, it's Vince McMahon doing everything he can to keep something that he created under his umbrella. But of course, being that The Undertaker gimmick is owned by WWE, The Undertaker gimmick was not... It, it's not like... And this is... And there were people out there who probably thought this too. Oh, he signed the StarCast. He's going to show up at AEW's um, pay-per-view as The Undertaker. Yes, there were fucking idiots out there who do that. But, speaking of The Undertaker, let's talk about this. The Undertaker's last ride. This is one of WWE's brightest spots right now. They're Raw, SmackDown, and sometimes NXT. Well, NXT is never a bad show. It's never a terrible show. But there's just things about NXT sometimes that just, nah, it could have been better. And I don't know why they went that route. But anyway. One thing that WWE does better than anybody are these document documentaries that they do, these documentaries. 24s, the 365s, everything they one of these they do, it's just fantastic. Whoever they whoever puts this stuff together is great. And this one, this first episode was no different. The Undertaker's last ride. Just great stuff. Now People want to know some things that we learned. One of those things was, and I thought it was really interesting, is that the eye roll. You know the eye roll that Undertaker does? He comes out, and he just stands at the ring, and he rolls his eyes back in his head. I tried to do that, and I, I can never get my eyes to go all the way back. I don't know how he hasn't fucking got his eyes stuck in the back of his head. Anyway, that was all an ad lib. It was all just by chance. It wasn't something he was trying to do to get over. Just like a lot of things that you see talent do that come, gets over is not something that was in the script or something you're supposed to do. And the eye roll was definitely one of them. The main focus of Chapter 1 is The Undertaker's match with Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 33. And we'll get to that later. But that doesn't mean WWE didn't try to throw a few gems from the fat schools from, from, for old school fans too. One of the best came mere minutes into the documentary. That trademark eye roll gimmick, yep, it was never planned to be part of his act. Of course not. Half of the stuff that you see The Undertaker do in the last 20 years have not, was not probably planned in his gimmick. Taker recalls working a TV match against Greg the Hammer Valentine and choking the guy in the corner. And he worked the spot and he noticed a corner cam getting cozy with his action, so he rolled his eyes into the back of his skull and stared down the lens. There was a really good picture that they show, or like a good shot of this they show, of his eyes just rolling back in the back of his head in the documentary. When he returned backstage post-match, the rest of the roster was a buzz over the one spot. Bobby Heenan had quipped on comedy, look at that monster, look at that monsoon. He has no eyeballs. Along with the sudden nature of the spot, caught everyone by surprise, according to The Undertaker, it was an off the cuff ad-lib that he didn't think much of until people freaked out, which is usually how it works. It's like something happens in a match and like the eye roll and it's like, you don't think much of it. It's like, oh, it was just an eye roll. And next thing you know, he's been doing it for 20 plus years. There's, let me think here. Like Jake Roberts DDT, that wasn't supposed to happen. That was not something that he meant to do. It was just something that happened. He cut the guy, he fell backwards and the guy went down and the DDT was born. You don't think anything of it when it first happens, but when other people start noticing it, boom, it becomes part of your shtick or your act. Now, of course, as we know, this was about what was supposed to be his final match, which we'll talk about that later. Now, his worries about this, he was worried because he's getting older. He can't be the old taker that he was back 10 years ago who was putting on match after match after match classic from Batista to Edge to Shawn Michaels, Shawn Michaels, Triple H, Triple H, and so on and so forth. Even CM Punk and him had a hell of a match. But he was frightened, looked away from the camera as he muttered to that line during the, during the documentary. It summed up the crippling self-doubt in his nutshell, and it told a full story of human beings struggle to come to terms with his own physical abilities. Before WrestleMania 33, Taker believed he had no business being in that match with Roman Reigns. I agree wholeheartedly, aka Roman Reigns and him did not need to have a match because, and we'll talk about it later, what I think about that match. His crisis of confidence began with the earnest with the 2017 Royal Rumble. If you remember, he was in there 
the 2017 Royal Rumble was big in WWE's eyes because you had Goldberg, I think it was Goldberg, Brock Lesnar, and, Ro and The Undertaker all in the match at the same time at one time, or around the same time. There, as he traded some moves with Roman, the legend feared he was getting himself into an impossible situation. Would he really be able to give everyone the match they expected against Roman Reigns? Could he even hang with this hungry young superstar? He, sh he wasn't sure at one point. Taker notes that he was talking, taking an important spot on the, set on the card for someone who works hard all year to earn it. If he can't be up to live up to the billing and be the Undertaker, at least... The ones that we know, the one that we knew, we loved, and we couldn't get enough of at one time. Then he's spitting in that face of wrestling fans. Yeah, well, mm, well, yeah. His pre-WrestleMania 33 workout was definitely frightening, also. The essential lack of trust in himself, very much. There was, like, you could just tell that this entire, like, from the Royal Rumble to... The match at Mania, he just did not have any confidence at all. He was feeling only even worse than the closer he got crept towards the Mania match. Two days before locking up with Reigns, he retreated, he retreated to the Performance Center for a final workout that put his joints, muscles, and body in general to the test. He was scared shitless because of it, if you want to say so. Like, he was just scared that this was just going to all go wrong. Because this is your final workout. If things don't hold up here, how are they going to hold up in that match? Young here isn't fond of those last minute sessions because he always terrifies something will go wrong. Because yes, you're going for that last workout. You're pumping a little bit, you know, you're boosting your body up. You're getting yourself just a little bit like that last moment to see if everything is going to work for you. And you get into, so you go to that match and you have a hell of a match. Of course, with his age, he was 50, he's still in his 50s. I think he was in his late 40s at the time. I think he's 55 now. Like, he was in his early, he's in his early 50s at the time. He can go and go to pump some, like, do some, like, working out, you know, pump some iron, and he tears a bicep. Or he breaks, he tears an he um, tears a ligament in his knees. And that match is off because Undertaker is injured. Something will go wrong, he'll break down mentally and panic about performing to the required standard. Hearing him narrate footage of shrugs, bench presses, and other weight moving exercises with such a with a, such a crazy tone is very frightening. 48 hours before a match that meant, to, meant so much to him, one of WWE's most famous sons was agonizing over the thought of what of not being good enough. That should hurt the hearts of anyone who has grown up watching him work. I'm pretty sure anybody who's been watching The Undertaker, I'm 30, so my life has been the length of The Undertaker's career. I was born in March of 1990, so I, my life is a little bit longer than Undertaker's career in WWE. But I didn't really get to see The Undertaker start wrestling until 2004 or five because I did not grow up watching wrestling until 1997, which was WCW. I didn't know anything about The Undertaker for a couple years. But to people who have been watching The Undertaker, and yes, I went back on the network first came out and watched all Raw and SmackDowns going up to 2004. But that, anyway, anybody who is older than me, maybe they're 40, maybe 50, and they've been watching The Undertaker since day one. Just watching this section of the entire first part had to just pull at your heartstrings to see what this guy goes through every single year to... Put on a performance for us. You go out there, and I don't agree with the fact that he's still out there doing performance and like wrestling matches and taking away spots from other guys and like other men and women just because his name is The Undertaker. But if you get past that part and you like, you just gotta feel for the guy that this guy he wants to go out there have one last good match, and it's just sometimes you don't get that. We continue on. WrestleMania 30, um, 28 was a turning point. It was. When did the net crisis and confidence start? WrestleMania 30, when he was legitimately concussed by Brock Lesnar mid-match? No, no, no. Back when he had his stunners with Michaels for fear of God in him that he never topped that genius? No. It was WrestleMania 28. 
Triple H drained down endless steel chair shots, which uh, was still so horrible to watch. But 27, not 28, my bad, 27. That's when the mighty Undertaker realized that his body wasn't cut out for such barbarity anymore and that recovering from vicious brawls was taking its toll. He also marched into the match with serious hip issues that need seen to and wouldn't get that done until after working almost 30 minutes bell to bell with, with Triple H. Once he recovered and he had some surgeries, he felt good about a match with Trips at WrestleMania 28, which was of course the Hell in a Cell match, and another bout against CM Punk at WrestleMania 29. Still, he considers what clicked inside his mind at WrestleMania 28 as a real turning point in his iconic career. Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody should have had that much happen to him, especially at his age at the time. WrestleMania 28 was 12... No, it was not 12 years. It was like... It was like, yeah, shit. 28 was, what, six years ago? Or something like that. And or eight years ago, something like that. And I remember seeing that match live and just how much Triple H tried to mercilessly kick this guy's ass and took him down for the count. That, of course, was that match that Triple H lost, but he walked out. And also, if you saw, like, if you remember after that match, he's sitting there on the barricade, you know, trying to recover, and he watches The Undertaker get out of the ring and just collapse on the ground, and he goes, tries to go over to make sure, hey, is this guy okay? Is he going to be able to make it? Yes, he got carted out. This, of course, was the last time for a couple years that we saw Undertaker with long hair because he came because he shaved his head off and we got old man, bald man, um, old bald Undertaker the very next year, which I hated that fucking look. Now, as we know, WrestleMania 30, he got concussed. Doesn't remember anything past 3 o'clock that afternoon. And after his match with Brock Lesnar was over, Vince McMahon left WrestleMania to go visit The Undertaker to help make sure The Undertaker wasn't going to die on his watch. This guy, I know we all give a lot of flack for Vince McMahon, but when he leaves the most important show of the year to make sure the, big, the greatest creation in his life Makes is not going to be severely injured. That shows a lot for Vince McMahon. He cares about The Undertaker, but The Undertaker wasn't too happy about that. Anyone who watched The Undertaker's amazing appearance on Steve Austin's Broken Skull Sessions, which is awesome. If you have not seen Broken Skull Sessions with Undertaker, go watch it. That is awesome. He can barely remember anything about WrestleMania, I know. What people might not know is that an SUV containing Vince McMahon and Brock Lesnar Tailed Undertaker's ambulance, which I didn't know this. I knew Vince McMahon was there. Everyone knew Vince McMahon was there. I did not know Brock Lesnar was there. That was another thing that was about cool about this is that we find out things we didn't know about, like the eye roll. I didn't know. I knew Vince McMahon. It's been really known for the last few years that Vince McMahon. Let, it was actually that the next day, Paul Heyman came out and was like, Vince McMahon himself left WrestleMania to go with the Undertaker. I didn't know Brock was there. That was cool though. That was a nice little snippet right there. Both men were seriously concerned when The Undertaker returned backstage in a haze and couldn't stop grinning like he just downed a bottle of Jack Daniels, which anybody seen that before, that's probably not a good thing. Michelle McCool told WWE cameras that she was seriously troubled at the hospital. Taker couldn't remember his own name. He did find time to gently rib Vince McMahon like showing up through, showing up though. He said, don't you have a show to run? When the boss slipped out of the side of the ring and rushed over to check on one of his oldest stars. McMahon was distressed at the Undertaker's condition that he left the biggest show of the year to make sure he was alright. Again, he wanted to make sure that the best gimmick he has ever made didn't yet didn't die on him or didn't get severely injured. He cared, but to a certain extent. But yeah. Brock, and that's another thing. Is Brock Lesnar cared? This is Brock Lesnar? Wow, but no, yes, yeah, Brock Lesnar, yeah. One thing The Last Ride makes perfectly clear is that there is a, a lot of respect between Triple H and The Undertaker. One of the most poignant moments in the entire doc comes when Triple H says he can relate to the fact that Undertaker's diminished WWE schedule only made things tougher for him on the years rolled on. Which, yes, Undertaker went from having some of the hardest-hitting matches 
in the mid 2000s in the mid like, like the early 2010s the mid like late 2000s and the early 2010s to wrestling once a year they always talk about a stu- a talent being off for a certain amount of time is going to have ring rust Undertaker going from having a arduous schedule to having one maybe two matches a year mostly one matches a year and your body going from being beat up every night, week in and week out, 300 days a year to only getting beat up once a year. That's going to, like, your body, that's going to fuck your body up. It really is. So him leaving and coming back to Wrestle WrestleMania, it actually was more negative to Undertaker than it was positive. Because, yes, it, does, it means less stress on your body, but the body... Like, when you first start wrestling, and why they want you, like, every time you watch, I watch, like, the first things are tough enough. One of the first things they usually do is they have these guys run the ropes. Because you've got to callous your body. To be used to running and hitting those ropes every single night. When you stop doing that and only do it once every, th- every six months or every nine months, and, or once every, every year... Your body's not going to be used to that, so when you take that hit, or you take that shot to the ropes, or you take that chair shot to the back, your body's not, it's going to hurt worse than it would if you were taking a chair shot every single night because your body would be used to it. It's just like if you're a boxer and you're used to getting punched in the face, or you're like, if you're an MMA person, you get used to punched in the face. And then you stop for like three or four years and then you go, you know what, I'm going to come back. And you go to get punched in that face that first time. You might have lasted a lot longer when you were in training and wrestling and fighting every so often. But you stopped for years and then you want to come back. It's going to, your body's not going to be used to it. The exact thing happened to him when he began paring down his career somewhere between 2011 and 2012. Training hard for three to four months before a major match putting you all into... Taking an age to recover, then working through injuries towards the next one was tougher for Triple H and working every night. Of course it is. That's why he cannot sympathize with Undertaker's play. It's also probably why Hunter was the very first person waiting for his old foe behind the curtain of WrestleMania 33 in Orlando. He knew that, which was cool because after the match with Owen Range, we saw on the, cam- on the show, we saw Undertaker raise his fist and he go down. On the documentary, we see him go down and he comes out of the lift, and the very first person there is Triple H to give him to um, give him a hug. So, another great thing about that. Now, Triple H spotted this self doubt at WrestleMania 31. Two years earlier, he plumped up for a more intense approach. Bray Wyatt dropped in on the dock and said that he didn't know that the Undertaker was. Ravaged by self-doubt before the match at WrestleMania 31. Which, by the way, WrestleMania 31 match between Bray Wyatt and Undertaker was not a bad match. It wasn't a great match, but it wasn't a bad match. I think anyone in WWE did, to be fair. The icon kept things close to his chest, as he has done his entire career. Like, Undertaker lived this gimmick. He kept everything to to the chest. He probably has an inner circle of fans. um, The the, the, um, Broken Skull Crew, or whatever the hell um, it's called. And other than that, nobody else is in that. If it's not, if you're not in his crew, then I'm pretty sure you don't know Mark Calloway whatsoever. And he's all business when he's arrived in California. Triple H was the only one who spotted his internal struggles. He made a point of walking over to the pier, kneeling down alongside him because Undertaker was kneeling down and just thinking things over and trying to, you know, get over this doubt of his. Reminding him, to say, and he said to him, show them who the fuck you are. That was the one verbal joust, joust was all Taker needed to power his bones through the match with Wyatt and also restore some lost confidence for the rest of 2015. It was a powerful walk to watch two legends, The Undertaker and Triple H, eyeball one another at Royal before this match. It's even more incredible that see that Taker is the one with wavering pupils and under Triple H is the one reminding him that the bloody penom was called for that, that for a reason. It's just Undertaker, yes, I can totally understand The Undertaker having this self-doubt. I mean, again, you went from having matches that were classics. You were having, you were doing so much 
great stuff up until 2011. The very last time Undertaker was like really a full time was 2010, I think it was. Like WrestleMania 25, the year of WrestleMania 25, which was 11 years ago. So 2009, 2009, 2010 was around the last time Undertaker was really a full time guy. And then his final match with Shawn Michaels, he start he felt a little bit more buffed up, and then he was starting to take more time off. And then eventually he became the one show a year guy. And when you go, and again, when you go from fighting and wrestling matches five times a week or four times a week, every single week, 300 days a year to one day a year, it's going to fuck your body up. It just is. Then there's nothing you can do about it. We did get some relief on the bubbling emotions for... Early on in the last slide, Taker was shown arriving at the airport in Orlando a few days before WrestleMania 33. As he's standing at the desk doing business, Roman Reigns sneaks up from behind him, doesn't say a word. Just doesn't say a word. When Undertaker clocks in... When Chuck sees him out of the corner and he jokes, Really? You can't kayfabe for like 10 minutes? The National Jovo Exchange changes brief. They're laughing it up. The um, hotel people are laughing it up too. But it's another win for WWE's film because it shows a lighter side to Mark Calloway when he's not working his legendary gimmick to his credit. And perhaps a little con- shocking because he must have known that there was a guy going to come on. Uh, <clears throat> must have known that, that was going on at the time. Reigns fires back a quick, screw your camera guy. The pair come across like high school buddies rubbing on another in the lunchtime. And it actually quite is funny. It, hey, it shows that, hey, things are not working right. It's like most of this is, was a sad and somber thing. Just seeing Undertaker go through what he has been going through for the last. By the way, this documentary is going to be going from 2017 to 2020. I'd say probably up to the Boneyard match. So about mid-March of this year. But just to see him have a little bit of joking fun. You see, like I said, you see Roman and him are laughing. The can't be, um, hotel people are laughing. It is kind of, it is a good hearted portion of this um, entire thing. And no, it doesn't. The writers, this. As we know, the, the match at WrestleMania 33 was not a good match. Undertaker, Roman Reigns, was bad. The episode shows the match. It shows highlights of the match. I mean, it doesn't show the whole match. I mean, that would have taken up a little bit longer than we needed to. I forgot that J.O. was on that call. I honestly forgot Jim Ross was on that call. The match was just... Like, it just showed how bad Undertaker was in that match. Like, and you're just sitting there, and it's like, you want to you wanna sit there and say... Like, you want to look at it and it's like, man, this guy's gone through a lot. And just to see him go out there and give you everything he could. Mm. Mm. So, as we know, this is a five-part episode. This is a five-part show. It's a five-episode show. What's on the next one? This was supposed to be Undertaker's last match. This was supposed to be it. That's why he took the gloves. He put the hat back on. He put the jacket back on. Then he took the gloves, put them on, down took the jacket, took it down, and put it on his on his gloves, and then took the hat and put it that way, and broke character to interact with his wife, who was in the crowd. And then he walked back up, raised his fist, and went down, and was supposed to be The Undertaker's swan song. That was it. He was passing the torch to Roman. But we get a preview of what's going to be happening tonight. Chapter 1 ends on a fairly happy note. Taker t- thinks he has retired, his wife is happy, Vince McMahon is content, and he can ride off into the sunset. There's obviously more twists and turns to come from the series. As the end of the debut episode, Taker is sent showing cringing as he watches footage of the Mania 33 match back with his wife Michelle McCool. He was left severely disappointed by what he was supposed to do in his final bow. Which, Taker, I hate to tell you this, but not everybody gets that swan song, that, that perfect match, that perfect last call before you can close your career. You had the perfect send-off. The match might not have been the best, but you had fans crying their eyes out. You could see men and women, when you go back and you watch that, they even showed it in here. When you have men and women literally crying because they grew up watching you, 
and you're leaving they say thank you taker if i'm correct that the stuff in his like his gear and stuff stayed in the middle of that ring until everybody was gone that was the perfect send-off nobody remembered the match everybody was going to remember the, the way you left so you to ruin that kind of still pisses me off to this day the fact that that was the perfect send-off whether the match was good or bad you had the perfect send-off now what they did this past Sunday, this past um, WrestleMania was a good send-off too. But again, he put the gloves, the coat, and the hat in the ring, and he left as if it was not The Undertaker, but Mark Calloway. Now, Chapter 2 will, of course, include an in-depth look at the, the annoyance as well as building towards The Undertaker referred to as achieving redemption by enter, entering a much slicker performance in his next match. Of course, his follow-up was a two-minute squash by to John Cena, so I don't even want to get into that. Now, if you're a fan, before we get into anything else, if you're a fan of The Undertaker, this is an essential watch, plain and simple, all five episodes. This was fantastic. Undertaker is always going to be a legend. No matter if the Boneyard match is his last match, if the match of WrestleMania 33, if the WrestleMania 33 match was it, then I'm all for it. Everybody expected it to be the final match. The only person who wasn't happy was The Undertaker. And of course, that's the one that matters. So, part two will be tonight. I'll talk about it next week. It was absolutely fantastic. Go check it out. If you haven't seen part one, Part 2 will be on demand sometime tomorrow. Uh, I mean tonight. Check it out. Watch it. And enjoy whatever it is. Because this is, some, this is one of WWE's bright spots. When they do these Academy Awards. And these rewards are like best documentary. Why has WWE not been up for any of these? These like. How are they not up for like best documentary. In any of these award shows. Because by far. They have some of the best document documentaries. You will ever see this last ride if this is not a part of the academy's award thing i don't know what the fuck you tell you because this is great i haven't seen any of the last dance for michael jordan even though i'm a big fan of bulls and everything because i don't get espn right now i'll find out a way to watch it another way but this is fucking great what isn't great is what we saw on monday night raw Monday Night Raw, we had Seth Rollins and Murphy take on Rey Mysterio and Aleister Black, who did not die last Sunday. Now, Seth Rollins was in a comatose state pretty much the entire match until Rey Mysterio hit him with an elbow. And then Seth Rollins, who was not in the match at all, locks a 619, grabs Rey Mysterio, tosses him down, and the ref calls a DQ. I'm sitting there watching, what the fuck just happened? Apparently, this was... A secret rule that we never even heard about. On uh, earlier this week, and um, the finish seemed strange as Mysterio was going to hit a six one nine on Murphy when Rollins, while outside the ring, caught Mysterio's legs on the ropes and slammed him into the floor. Despite Rollins being part of the match, Rollins and Murphy were disqualified. Brian Alvarez revealed on Wrestling Silver Live that there was a little known there is a little known rule where the legal man in a tag team match can't attack the other team's legal man. The one exception is to break up a pin. Also, when there's a legal tag, both persons that the both the ta person that was tagged in and the rest are going to the apron can beat on the opponent for the team's competitor for five seconds. If that doesn't make your head hurt, there's more. If the legal man, you are allowed to hit the other team's legal man, even though the illegal man can't touch the competitor who is legal. Also, both the legal men can't can't fight each other. Oh, according to Alvarez, Vince McMahon is adamant, adamant that this rule be enforced. Wrestlers have apparently had this nick, had the nick spots in the matches in the past because they violated this rule. It is very confusing, so here's some uh, some gist. This, how it works in using using the Rey Mysterio versus and Alistair Black versus Rollins and Murphy match as an example. And Mysterio and Murphy are legal men. Mysterio can attack Rollins since Mysterio is the legal man. Rollins isn't. Rollins cannot attack Mysterio unless Rollins is breaking up Mysterio, spinning by putting Murphy. Rollins and Black can attack each other if Murphy tags and Rollins. Both men can beat up Rey Mysterio for five seconds. My question is, why has this not been a, an established rule forever? Why wouldn't you make this an established rule so we're not sitting there scratching your head going, what the fuck? 
I, I just cannot. I cannot even understand. It just, it makes, it makes no sense how you're going to sit there and like, oh, by the way, this can't happen because this is a rule in Vince McMahon's book. Establish it in canon so we know what the fuck is going on if you're going to use it. It's not that difficult. Ugh, WWE. Just another fucked up week for them. AEW ratings went down. NXT ratings went down. Raw's rating went down. Overnight rating for SmackDown was up. That is that. Now, with the survey that we talked about earlier, I'm hoping WWE actually does... I'm hoping and I'm sure people would put, well, give us a crowd. I don't care if you have 5, 10, 15, 20 people in the crowd, whether it's spread out or not. There was enough room in that performance center that you could have 30 fucking people in there. If you want to spread them out enough, I don't care. Just do it. Just do it. And give us some ambiance. Because I don't know how many more weeks people we can take of no crowds at all. But... I'm gonna get out of here. If you haven't, like I said, if you haven't seen The Undertaker's Last Ride Part 1 before Part 2 comes out, make sure you go check that out. That is a thing of beauty. It's one of WWE's biggest strengths. But hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video. Find me on Twitter at The France Club. Find me on twitch.tv slash The France Club. And I will see you guys tomorrow for what is probably going to be another piss poor episode of Monday Night Raw because we get Baron Corbin versus Drew McIntyre in the main event. Who wants that? But I'm getting out of here. I'll see you guys later.